message tonight is prophecy reveals how to defy death. That's good news. What do you say? A number of years ago, a little boy was in a sleepy town of Vermont when it was 95 degrees. Aww. That's springtime down here in the valley. But for those in Vermont, in the middle of July, the humidity was high. Nothing was happening in that little, small, sleepy town of 3,500 people. A boy was sitting on the cracker barrel on the general store front porch with a knife in one hand and a piece of wood in the other. Whittling away at that piece of wood, it was beginning to be close to the 12 o'clock hour, and then that time came when the grandfather clock began chiming. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve times. The grandfather clock did what it always had done. And then it did something that it never did before, because as a young man sitting there counting each chime of the big grandfather clock inside the general store, it rang a 13th time. He threw the knife that way and the piece of wood that way and ran down the street of that sleepy little town, hollering, it's never been that late before. Now, some of you don't know what I'm talking about unless you were here last night and understood what we discovered in Daniel chapter 2. We're not living in the time of the head of gold, the chest and arms of silver, thighs of brass, legs of iron. We're way down there in the toenails of that Daniel 2 image, if I may, understanding exactly that God is carving out in humanity a kingdom that will be established very soon where all of us will be able to see the prophecies come to pass before our very eyes. God has a plan of informing his people, so we will not be caught off guard as these last events of Revelation take place. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 3 to page 882 in your seminar Bibles. I hope you received your notebooks tonight, and I want to welcome all of you that are watching on the web this evening. It's a privilege to set time aside to understand God's word. Daniel chapter 3, amazing story as Daniel continues to record the events. Now, I don't want you to say it out loud like somebody did the other night, but I hope you're studying for that chapter that Daniel didn't write. We'll be talking more about that in the coming nights. Jesus, in chapter 1, revealed that he can turn any circumstance that seems to be in defeat into what? Oh, you're looking for the page in your Bible. Into what, my friends? Victory, that's right. How many believe Jesus can turn, turn defeat into victory? Amen. Praise the Lord. God says that's the lesson of number one. If you don't believe it, read and study the story of Daniel. It's simple, childlike stories. But if you're looking for God's message for you, you'll find it where you're looking. Who does he reach in chapter one? Those that get hit with the unexpected. I'm sure every one of you have had a number of occasions in your life where you thought you had life well planned and then all of a sudden you wake up one morning and everything seems to fall apart. Jesus says, watch me, I'll turn it into victory. Chapter two, this whole book's written for the time of the end. Jesus reveals himself as the true source of the information for the future. How many believe Jesus holds the keys to your future? Let me see your hands. I hope you have that hope. Jesus lays these foundational principles down. If you think you're being defeated right now, look to Christ. He'll give you victory. Amen. And when he gives you victory, he'll also give you the confidence to hold fast for your futures on the way. Who's he reach with, number two? He's reaching those who feel forgotten and want to be used by God. Why? Because of the time period between the time in chapter one when Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, were found ten times wiser. Three and a half years go by with nothing mentioning their name. Just being the people God had taught them to be, even in a place called Babylon. Can you relate tonight? You may be living in a place that you didn't choose. You may be working at a place that you wouldn't choose if you had an option. You may be getting a small pay that you definitely did not choose. But watch and see, it's not over yet because you already won more than the Powerball. Amen. That'll hit you on the way home. <laughs> Tonight, my friends, Jesus has a purpose for his prophecies. He has a purpose for the stories that are related to his prophecies. 
And he wants us to see them. Why? Because as we read and understand the book of Daniel, as Jesus instructed us to in Matthew chapter 24, he's preparing us to be able to open up the book of Revelation where it comes home to our heart. No longer is it a book of mystery, but it's a book that reveals Jesus and his character. Daniel has a lot of symbols in it. We'll get into each one of those as we go on. And again, I hope you're sharing the material with your pastor in your own church that others can respect you as one who's interested in prophecy and God will open up doors that you never imagined. As we continue tonight, we're going to see some parallels between the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. Daniel chapter 2, God is revealed as our prophet. Daniel chapter 3, which is tonight's message, God's going to reveal again every night. He contrasts the authentic versus the counterfeit. Say it back to me. The authentic versus the counterfeit. One more time. So now God is going to reveal tonight that he is not only our Savior, our Lord. He is our Redeemer. You remember what the word redeem means? Bring back the value of that which you're looking at, in the eyes of its creator. It's not so much what we are worth to each other. It's what your life is worth to your creator God. And the only way you understand how valuable you are to God is if you know God and spend time with him. And every moment you spend time with your creator, you will come out of that moment, entering into the next one with joy in your heart because God accepts you as you are tonight. Can I hear a response? He's not waiting on you to be convinced that you're valuable before he instills in your loved mind that he created you. He knew everything you would do before you did it. And none of your acts of the past separates him from the love of this moment. That gives me hope. What do you say? That's the story of each one of God's people in the testaments that God has given us. Tomorrow night, we're going to enter into Daniel 4, a very interesting story that will bring that even home further. Let's read together. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king made a image of gold. Now, there's a lot of things that we could unpack here tonight. Bear with me. We can't do it all because of the time factor. The numerology of the Bible is very fascinating. In fact, some have written books thicker than the Bible on the sequence of numbers in the Bible, and they've almost made it their religion. Be careful about a Christian who says they believe in God and they get caught up in the minutia or the, the tangents of the Bible, and before long you can tell their attitude's changing. They'll even get to the place where they want to fight over it. I've seen grown men want to fight on whether the rapture's before the tribulation in the middle or after. Friends, that's not God's will. He wants us to get the whole picture and let God reveal through the power of his Holy Spirit what he wants you to see. But let's never argue over his word. What do you say? So here we see the height there of three score cubits. A score is 20, so three score would be how many? Oh, I got to get your mind back into thinking mode. Don't get in the TV mode. Three score cubits is how many? 60, that's right, and the breadth thereof was six cubits, and he set it up. Stop there. That's a simple first grade phrase that everyone could read and understand, or can we? Whenever the phrase shows up many times, God's trying to bring home a very important message. Last night, he talked about the image of gold, silver, brass, iron, and iron and clay, Tonight, the king, by the suggestion of some of his wise men, set up an image of all solid gold, and what God says nine times, you can count them in chapter three, that the king set this up. In other words, God had nothing to do with it. Nine times you can read that phrase, he set it up, meaning the king. God's trying to tell us, last night, God gave the king a blessing to receive a message from God that he needed a faithful follower of God to interpret it for the king, of course. Tonight, God is saying nine times, I had nothing to do with this, but mark it down. I want you to see what happens When a ruler doesn't like God's message and he gets advice from someone who does not believe in God, I hope you're listening tonight. These people that are running for political office build their whole career on their advisors 
And if they win, we think they're the best thing since apple pie. But remember, they only won the election because their advisors were smarter than the other advisors. But when they get in that office and shut the door by themselves, they need God more than ever before. And in addition to that, they need Christians who are praying for them. Oh, but Lynn, they don't believe in what we teach. You still need to be praying for your leaders. Over and over in every one of these chapters of these childlike stories, Daniel is pleading with God for the leaders. Isaiah said 150 years before Nebuchadnezzar was born, Nebuchadnezzar was God's chosen one. How could he be? Especially after tonight's story. God knows every sin before we commit it. And even Nebuchadnezzar was created by God. Boy, it's quiet in here. Let me say something, you'll probably even be quieter. Even Obama's been created by God. Oh, better keep going. I'm getting on thin ice. I can feel it. All right, so he set it up in a certain plane, the providence of Babylon. The dimensions are unique, one short of God's perfect number, which is? Seven, okay, you can study that as we go on, but let's look at verse two. Nebuchadnezzar the king sent the, together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers and the counselors and the sheriffs and all the rulers in the providence to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar had what? Had set up nine times. God said the king did this. He had nothing to do with it. Then the princes and governors, and he keeps repeating itself, and all these rulers came together, together to dedicate the image that the king set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the herald cried aloud, to you it is what? All right, watch carefully. God commands his people, but you notice the difference? The command to, from God to his people is, is something God's people long to hear. Can you respond? God's people long to hear the commands of God. Why? Because we know when God gives his faithful a command, it's necessary to live and to have life. But when the rulers that God did not set up, when those who are elected, if I may, command to force worship, watch out, there's trouble for God's people. Well, study this word worship. God talks about it a lot, especially in the book of Revelation. Worship is a key ingredient because the root word of worship is showing what something is worth. Think about that every time you go into your church. Do you go in to show off your new clothes? Do you go in to show off your new car because you have to park in that one spot? Or you just go in because there's a great group of people you've learned to love? You go in because they have excellent food after the worship service? All of that is not important. If you're going in to show what God means to you and you want to give him praise, that time period will be the best time of your life. So the command is given to all people on planet Earth at that time, to all languages, there weren't any language barriers, that at the time when you hear the music, I need to pause here because theologians for a number of years debated about this. It had to be re written after the fact. It, Daniel was not a prophet. All of the book of Daniel is just recording what happened. And it had to be written thousands of years or some say hundreds of years after the time of Daniel, we say, why? Because they go on to talk about these instruments. And they said the dulcimer was never created until approximately 500 years after Daniel's time. And so they said, see, that couldn't have been written back in Daniel's time. Wrong. Archaeologists have dug up enough cuneiform tablets and findings from the past that we have found dulcimers most recently in Daniel's time. But that's okay. So there's music involved when they're commanded to show value to the statue. A statue that was man's counterfeit, trying to change his future. It was set up by man, all the rulers were required to worship it, and why is it 60, or 60 cubits by six? And here it says 90 feet, because a cubit was the dimension from the elbow of the king to the longest finger of the king. Now, can you imagine being a contractor in that time and all of a sudden you're building a house and all of a sudden the king dies, a new young king comes on the scene, the cubit changes. They send out the new rulers. That'll hit you on the way home, especially if you're a contractor. All right, so last night 
we learned the Daniel 2 image gave us a lot of information affirming the authenticity of the word of God. I also told you last night that it will give you information regarding the Antichrist. Hang on to what you heard last night. Share it with your pastor. He'll be very interested in it as we get into a coming night very soon when we dialogue about the Antichrist, and he will want that DVD, I promise you. All right, so with this in mind, all of this information would have been wiped away by the king's counterfeit. You know, some people say, oh, what difference does it make? Friends, I promise you, you start changing God's word, you're pulling out valuable keys. Did you hear me tonight? Our country has thrown the word of God away and say it doesn't matter. Religion's religion. You go play in your religion if that's what you have to do. There's so many religions. How can you be dogmatic and say Jesus is the only way, truth, and the light? That's not being dogmatic. Try telling a, an engineer of a spacecraft that's going to hold your son as he goes off to the moon that all the details don't matter. Are you hearing me tonight? You wouldn't encourage an engineer of the spacecraft that your child is going to ride to the moon, not worry about details. That's foolish. And yet we do that with life by saying the word of God is not that important. The statue was a counterfeit. And if those individuals that showed value to that counterfeit ignored the authentic, they lost the value, the message that God had for us. Nebuchadnezzar's tablets on old precision way, the old road leading down to old Babylon, still there today, reveals what problem Nebuchadnezzar had. And yet, God still called him his chosen. As we find on those tablets... This is what he said about himself, the fortification of Eskel in Babylon, I strengthened and established the name of my reign forever. Unfortunately, that's humanity's problem, always worshiping the creator. No, the created instead of the creator. That's the root problem of most of our problems on planet earth. All right, let's look at the key issues of chapter three. Number one, we have a corrupt king. He's still God's anointed, And the story isn't finished until tomorrow of of this man. He's erecting a counterfeit image. And because of that, for the faithful, listen, only for the faithful, there was a great time of what? Trouble. Trouble. Now listen carefully. If Jesus said, which he did, to read and understand this book, and four times in the last chapter of chapter 12 of Daniel, it said it was written for what time? The time of the end. If that's the case, God says to read this because there's a time coming, and we'll see it in a moment, where these same dynamics will take place. A force worship, worshiping an image, a likeness of, but not the identical. Furnace heated seven times hotter. Why? Because those Israeli children... Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Ezra. They had this holy number by seven. So the king says, you like seven? Heat it up seven times. And whether we like the issue or not, this is where it gets a little shaky out here. We have a church power. Why? Because they were forcing worship. And we have a state power under the leadership of Nebuchadnezzar coming together under Babylon. Remember that, because we're going to see in Revelation, the first Babylon has already fallen. The second Babylon is about to fall in your lifetime. Jesus said, again, Daniel was a true prophet. He said, read and understand. Very important for us to remember the words of Jesus as we continue. All right, as we go on, Daniel leads us to believe the keys to Revelation can be known by God's people. Put a marker there in Daniel chapter 3. We'll come back to it in just a moment. Let's look at Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13 is a direct parallel to this tonight, and we'll have a whole topic on these two beasts. There's two beasts in Revelation 13. The first one, everyone agrees, is talking about the Antichrist. The second one is the interesting one that we'll study in depth another time. But let's look at the dynamics of Revelation 13, because in it, we'll see, begin to see the parallel or the mirror, if I may, of what we're going to study in Revelation or in Daniel chapter 3 tonight. 
Revelation chapter 13 and verse 12. It says, and he exercised all the power of the first beast. Who's the he there? The second beast. But just look at the, the rough dynamics of this. Before him, and what's it say there? And what? Oh, that's a little weak. I know you're looking at the Bible. And what? Cause it. That's forcing who? The earth. Help me out here. And them which dwell therein to do what, friends? To worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So there's a second beast coming on the scene. I'll just tell you this. As we unpack these passages in the coming nights, you're going to discover a beast represents a king or kingdom. So when you have two beasts here, one is imitating the, the first one, and he's forcing all the world to worship. And he had power to give life. Now that word life there takes us back to when God formed man of the dust of the earth, breathed into him the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Here this second beast makes an image to the first beast and gives it life. There's something this second beast will do in your lifetime that will be a direct parallel. How do I know that? Because it's going to both speak and cause. And those two words in the Greek means force by legislation, a combination of church and state power there. That as many as would not what? Worship, show value to the what? Not to the first beast, but to the system of worship or showing values that the first beast set up. That's what it's telling here. There's gonna be a death sentence. It says, would be killed. All right, don't let that worry you. But Lynn, don't let it worry you. Why? Because this is a seminar of hope, what do you say? And if we believe that Jesus created this world, died on the cross, was resurrected with you on his mind, don't believe for a moment that you're going to be lost without seeing Jesus. Jesus is doing everything heavenly possible to get us all ready here tonight. I don't care what sin you're struggling with tonight. If the men of the Bible can be ready to meet Jesus when they chose, so can you. What do you say? All right, so let's go back now. We see a sign of loyalty. A gr loyal group remains in Revelation, and we'll see the same thing tonight in Daniel chapter 3. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 3. We will get into the Antichrist, I promise you. I've had some people say already, well, Lynn, how come you're not getting into the 666 and all that? Bear with me. God doesn't mention in Daniel 1, nor does he mention in Revelation 1. He wants to make sure our characters are ready for that kind of truth. I see too many, may I say, ugly Christians who all they want to talk about is the Antichrist and the 666 and all that conspiracy theory. Let's walk through the pages of prophecy as Jesus reveals and let him prepare our hearts for that information. I promise you, the night we talk about the Antichrist, you'll know more than all the members in your church about it. Just if you take home 50% of what you get here. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 3 and let's continue on this journey because it's powerful tonight. Therefore, at the time when the, all the people heard the sound of these instruments, if I may summarize, all the people of all nations of languages fell down and what? Worship that golden image that the king had set up. Wherefore at the time, certain Chaldeans, now you remember the Chaldeans, they were the historians. They were the ones that had all the facts of the past and they were very interested in the prophecies of the future and they thought they could prophesy based upon the statistics of the past. I guess you might call them pollsters today where they do a survey and come up with a very statistically, analog, uh, an, uh, very statistically proven fact about who's going where with what opinion. So the Chaldeans came back and they thought they had all the information. Well, they did about this law to worship, but they come to the king and said, King, uh, excuse me, there's certain Jews, certain faithful people to what they've been taught in your kingdom that you've put in control. I hope you're hearing it tonight. Certain people that you put in the proper place and you've spent a lot of time and energy making sure that they have positions of leadership and king, you know, you could tell by their attitude. We weren't really in favor of that. And guess what? They're not bowing down. 
They're not worship. They're not showing value to what you have established. All the music's playing, and they're not worshiping what you've set in place. And whosoever falls not down, they're going to be cast in that burning fire furnace. You know, they're reminding the king of something he just passed. It's almost like they were afraid the king was going to get soft on the law of the land. They're leaving no chance for any mercy to come from that king. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon. And he says the pagan names again. They have not reckon, uh, regarded thee, and they serve not thy gods, not worship the golden image which thou hast set up. King, we've got a problem. And Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded these men to be brought to him. Now, let me stop here. In all fairness, this king did something that I wish every Christian would do. What, build a fiery furnace and scare all your people in church into obeying? No. He heard that somebody, no, let me do this. Have you ever heard that somebody said that somebody said that somebody said that some, I'm not stuttering, that somebody said something about you? What do you do? The king heard that these men were not obeying and he said, bring them to me. He didn't say just destroy them as an example. They need to be taught a lesson. No, he said, bring them to me. If Christians, instead of repeating rumors that have been said about themselves and trying to build a pity party, if they just go back to the person that you were told said it about you and give them the benefit of the doubt like the king did, it would solve the majority of our problems in the Christian world. Too many times you talk about another denomination, oh, they believe this and this and this. Mitt Romney, when he was running for presidency, the rumors that were out there about the Mormons, give me a break, there's, there's no way they could believe in all the things that people said about them. They'd look for some small microcosm of the Mormons that used to believe this way and they'd splatter it all over his reputation. Why is it as Americans we love to find dirt on other people? We spend more time on that than we do the truth, unfortunately. The king calls his men before him. And he said, is it true? I mean, he was already angry, and he brings them in and says, what do you think you are? Who do you think you are? No, no. He said, is it true? He gives them the opportunity that if they were misunderstood or they didn't understand the command, or maybe they were fascinated with the music, he gives them all kind of room to set wrongs right. Now, face it, friends, if the king that did not honor God can give opportunities to those who don't follow him to set wrongs right. I think we're in a time where Christians can do that. What do you say? Nebuchadnezzar, okay, is it true? Do you not serve my gods nor worship the golden image that I have set up? And he said, now listen, if you're ready when you hear the music, he's given them the command direct from himself, so there's no misunderstanding. And watch, he's going to bring in the fact that they were serving their God. He knew what they were doing, but he was giving them another opportunity to get it straight from his lips. If you fall not down or you worship and the image that I have set up, but if you worship not, what happens? You shall be cast the same hour. In other words, you won't get a break like I gave Daniel before. Now, that's a good time to stop for a moment and say, where was Daniel? Because the only names we see mentioned here were the three friends of Daniel. Now, that's an interesting study, and it's not one you want to spend a lot of time in. But commentators, most commentators agree that he was sent out of town. If you watch the video beforehand, they sent him out of town. He went away on the king's business. Why? Because the king knew that Daniel was not going to buckle. And he would not sacrifice the life of Daniel to set up this golden image. So he was either out of town or some say he was standing beside the king where he didn't have to necessarily bow down. There's very few that say that. Most agree that he was sent out of town. But what, what does this tell us today? What is God trying to tell us? You know, many churches rise and fall based upon the pastor. I want you to think about that. That's not God's plan. God's plan is individually all of us be directly connected to our creator. And then churches will remain strong regardless who's up here. 
Okay, so he tells them, the three men, that if you don't listen and obey, you're going to be thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. And then say it with me. Who is that God that shall what? Deliver you out of my hands. All right, now listen. Before we go any further tonight, we have to agree, because we know the rest of the story. It's easier to be a Monday morning quarterback. We know the rest of the story that he recognizes God when he shows up on the end of this story. So he knows God, but listen, he does not know the power of God. Did you get it? There are a lot of people around us today that will not set foot in a church. They know about God, but they don't know the power of God. Who is that God that can deliver you out of my hands? Okay, watch these men. I'm about to ask you a question. Watch for details. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I hate saying those pagan words, answered and said to the king, oh, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Let me be politically correct. That's, that's, let me paraphrase. What they're basically saying is we will not be politically correct. With due honor, king, we're not going to say things to make you happy. There's a time for every one of our lives where you're going to have an opportunity to stand for truth. And at that time, you want to show respect to who you're speaking to. But don't bend the truth to find a place to extend your life. Your life has been created for a very specific time, specific place, specific situation where you will stand by the power of God and even surprise yourself by the words that God gives you to speak. You know the times that maybe you've already had to do that. Men, may I speak to you for a moment? Maybe you've been given a position of leadership in your workplace. And over the number of years, you've developed relationships with those people you work with in the office. And as you get up out of your desk and go to the drinking fountain or the break room, you always pass that room where that special lady is, who always treats you with an honorable respect. Over the years, you've grown to know each other in every event of your lives you share together. And before long, that relationship gets a piece of your heart. And you know where it'll take you if you don't determine before you get out of your desk where your thoughts will lead you. God teaches us to know the principles that he teaches us from, from his word that when we know we're entering into temptation, we can put barriers up where God can keep our lives holy. You go to the Christmas party, and in that Christmas party, you know what's going to happen. The majority of people have so much pleasure. They drink too much, and before long, there isn't anything godly about that event. You have to determine, if you want to remain faithful to God, what you will do in that party before you go. What do you say? That's exactly what these three friends of Daniel determined before they went to that ceremony. They knew in advance what would be required of them. And now they're speaking to the king with due respect. We are not going to be politically correct before you, king. It's not an accident that God brings out this principle in chapter 3. He doesn't reveal it to us in chapter 1. Why? When we discover that God can turn defeat into victory, when we discover God has our future, then he'll put you in a situation. Why? That you can be tested and you will reveal the character of God. Can I hear a response? That's what God's people will do. It's not what we have to do. We will not do anything that we don't choose. It's what God's people will do when the test comes. There they are standing before the king. The king letting them know this was a death decree involved. And they say, we will not be careful about how we answer you with respect. Now watch carefully. What's the first word? Um, you're quiet out there tonight. What's the first word? If. All right. Here's the question for you, and I'll ask for the answer in a moment. Did these three men know that God would deliver them out of the fiery furnace? How many say yes? How many say no? How many don't like raising your hands? <laughs> Watch carefully. If it be so, our God whom we serve is what? 
is able to deliver us. All right, let me rephrase the question. Did they know that God was able to deliver them? But they did not know that he would deliver them. Get the point. When you're tested to the fact that you know you could lose your life in this circumstance, have the faith that your God is able to deliver you. What do you say? But whether or not he does, that's his business. And don't try to be God. Your life belongs to God. He gives it to you every second of your, of, your, of your life. He gives it to you. So if he chooses to take it away by cancer or anything else, know your God is able to deliver you. But whether or not he does, that's his business. I've been 15 plus years. I shared you the picture of the motorhome last night. Driving that 60,000 pound operation down the road. And every time I get behind the steering wheel, maybe it's because my hair turned color from red to whatever it is now, that I, I get anxiety that I never had before. But I always, God can tell you when we get to heaven and he opens up my DVD of life, or Blu-ray or whatever it is, or maybe a stone up there, whatever, he will show you every time I get behind the wheel, Lord, I'm feeling anxious right now because there's a lot of responsibility. I've had tires blow out and it pulled the rig over to where I almost lost my life. There are many stories, but I get in behind that wheel and I say, God, this equipment belongs to you. It might have my name on the title, but it's all your doings. You know why I drive this from town to town. It's in honor and praise to your name. And if you choose to let this break down, it's your business. If you give me the courage, I'll be faithful. And then I can drive with confidence. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. Ah, we don't know whether he's going to burn us, but we do know that we're going to be out of your dictatorship. But if what? If not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods. Now, how does that apply to our lives tonight? You know, the truth is, friends, every one of us sitting here have more than one God. Not me, Lynn. Well, I hope that's the truth. But a God is anything we spend more time and money on than we spend serving God. That's the honesty of it. Where do your thoughts take you when you have lag time? What do you think about? What is your temptation? Oh, if I just had enough money, I could do this and this and this. Quite frankly, it's our God. We will not serve thy gods, nor worship the what, my friends? The golden image which thou hast set up. You know, some people teach that faith is like a good luck charm. If you just have enough faith, you'll never get sick. Well, we know better than that. You'll never go in debt. You'll never be discouraged. And the number of people, when they get depressed, they feel like they're not good enough to make it to heaven. Why? Because thou shalt not get depressed if you're a Christian. That's what they've been taught. And then they talk, call their other fellow Christians. And they say, oh, you just need to pray. You just need to have more faith. You should never be depressed as a Christian. You just need more faith in God, they'll tell you. Wrong. It's a proven fact that chemical imbalances in the brain can cause you to go in depression. We put more chemicals in our food today than ever before. I know firsthand. I worked in a city in Pennsylvania. I won't say the name of it tonight in case this pastor is watching, but he was a chemical engineer, food engineer, and he said, I can't handle this anymore. I can't believe we're putting such chemicals in the foods. So he quit. Went back to college, went on to be a pastor. And I worked with him in Pennsylvania. And he said, Lynn, do you believe it? I worked in a factory where they produced salads. Now, I thought salads, that's a good thing. You know, we, we all ought to eat more green salads. But after I was working there a month, I started getting these bad pains at, at 15, 16 years old. And I thought, what in the world? My lungs hurt. My body ached all over. I felt like I was getting flu symptoms. This is before I got malaria. So I took the, the, the tab off the barrel 
with all the chemicals described in this powder we were dumping in the water and then all salad had to go through that water. I took the tab off with all the chemicals. It must have been 60 different chemicals in that barrel. And I took them to my chemistry teacher because I was in high school at the time. I said, can you tell me what these chemicals are? And he sat down, he was very, used to be a policeman, then he was a teacher for chemistry. He, he sat down with me and looked up each one of them. Five of them were deadly poison. Deadly poison. Now, after he went through the list, he says, Lynn, what are you doing with these chemicals? Why are you asking these questions? He said, you shouldn't be anywhere near these chemicals. I told him, I said, you know that salad factory I'm working in? Yeah. All the salad has to be dipped in that before it's shipped out to all the major hotels and restaurants. <gasps> My friends, we don't understand what's taking place in the world around us. Before we feel depressed because we're depressed, let's give God glory and understand he knows all of our circumstances before we get into that and allow him to solve the problems of life. What do you say? Hang on to your faith. It's a gift of God. All right, let's get back to the story. Now that I've burned an image of what you're eating when you eat salad. These three men came to the place in their life where all of their faith was tested to the very foundation. And all their career that they had been given, listen, by God, God saw fit to put them in positions of leadership in Babylon, yes or no? He did, he blessed them. He caused them to be 10 times wiser in chapter one. He caused them to be part of that prayer meeting where God blessed them with the knowledge of them. And now here they are. It would have been very easy for them to say, Daniel's out of town. Come on, guys. When the music plays, let's just bend down and fix our sandals. God understands. God, what's in our mind? He's not going to burn us in hell because we had to fix our sandals. After all, he gave us this. Do you see what human reason can do to your faith? Are you hearing me today? You know when your faith is tested. You get on the internet and that wrong sight comes up. You turn on the television and that show comes on that you know doesn't draw you closer to Christ. It may not be that time where you're standing before all the employees at the place you work and have to turn your face away from a joke you don't want to hear. It may not be that bold. It may be in the privacy of your own home with your angels recording your thoughts and feelings. But remember, God knew that moment would come to you before you got there. And this moment and every moment in the future will never separate you from the love of God. Amen. Then Nebuchadnezzar was so angry because he could not change their mind. He was so angry that his makeup didn't cover his redness. And so what did he do? He spoke and commanded that the furnace would be heated seven times more than it was wanted to be heated. And he commanded those mighty men that were in his army to bind these men. Now stop, I want you to grab the details. Because the truth is, friends, if we don't understand this simple story of Daniel chapter 3 and we spend all of our time in Daniel 11 and Daniel 12 because we think that's more about our time, we won't make it through the Daniel 11 and 12 because we did not understand that there may come a time that you will be tied up. Are you hearing me tonight? Because that's when your faith will be tested to the breaking point. When you are physically tied because you're standing for Christ. What will you think of God then? Why does he let this happen to me? Why does the Lord let me get cancer? Why do I have all these physical ailments when I've dedicated my entire life to him? Friends, unless you come to that moment in time, you have not been tested. When Jesus says, read and understand this story, it's so that we could gl glean the simple principles of a Christian faith. The men were given permission to tie up God's ambassadors. And to do what with them? Come on, help me. And to do what with them? 
cast them into the hottest place that existed at that place. And I'm sure when they landed in there, they didn't land on their feet. How do I know that? Because then these men were bound in their coats, their hosens, their hats, and their garments. And, and I wonder why they wore all that stuff in the heat of the desert. But anyway, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot. It was so hot that it killed the men. What men? Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah? No. God allowed them to be tied up. But we know the story. They weren't killed. So come with me to this moment. Can you imagine? All right, you're, you're thrown in. The mightiest of the army. It was so hot, it took their breath away. They died at the opening of the furnace. But the three men land on the hot coals. And can you imagine that moment? It must have been like a dream. They had never been there before. Did you get it? In the moment of your greatest trial, I can guarantee you it will be new to you. And only your faith that God has given you in your past, only those times of prayer where it was just you and God wrestling out the details of life, those moments will be like money in your spiritual bank that will give you what you didn't know you had, a faith that was strong enough to be tested by the mighty God of heaven. And when it's tested, it will come out as gold tried in the fire. This is what God's people need tonight. Not debate over theological issues. Let God grow our faith. That when this moment comes, my friends, you may be down. You may be tied. You may be in a circumstance where you can't move. Listen, friends, but get this. The only thing that was allowed to be burning is that which kept them from standing up. Did you get it? Now stop, let's bring it home. What keeps Christians from going out? Like Jesus said, go, teach, and baptize. Well, I don't have your teaching, Lynn. I was a plumber for 17 years. Yes, I had four years of Bible school. Why? Because I was so insecure, as I told you before, that when I sat there in the first grade class, I wet myself. I didn't even have enough confidence to tell the teacher I had to go to the bathroom. I was so timid and shy. That which keeps you from doing God's work is what God will burn up. Maybe it's we're so secure in our retirement account, our property that's paid for, our house that's paid for, our car that's paid for and still has four years of life. God says, if that's what you're counting, your security, it will all be taken before the trumpet sounds. And then where will you stand? It's not like God doesn't want you to be secure. No, he wants you to have security in Christ that can never be taken from you. These are the priceless gifts that God's people will have. It's nothing that you can buy at Walmart, I promise you. Don't try that. They'll really think you lost it. And you'll end up in the pharmacy, I promise you. The principle here, friend, is if you are the greatest of God's people, which Paul says don't compare yourself with anybody else, if you have the greatest faith on planet Earth, you will come to this moment where everything you've ever had or identified with, hear me. If my life is built and bound up in what I do from town to town, 115 different cities now, all over the world, if I have my security in what I'm doing right now, before the trumpet sounds, I will be nobody. And yet, I will be just as valuable in the mind of my creator as I ever was from the day I was born. That's the consistency of Jesus. And that's the gift God's people will have when these events take place. Because when you are truly in Christ, you know your value to your creator never changes. If you get an F on your test, if the boss fires you because he misunderstood, if your car breaks down that you just bought, if your house maintenance is twice as high as you ever expected, you are still as valuable this day as the day you were born. Amen. 
It's the devil who tries to grab a hold of the mind of God's people and say, look at you. How dare you think you are a Christian? And he beats you down and beats you down and beats you down until you can't find your faith. It may be even the blessing of your marriage that is beating you down and beating you down and beating you down until you lose that partner in life because of divorce and then you don't know who you are. God says, no. Read and understand, Daniel. Those men in the fiery furnace were not in there feeling insecure because they lost their position as a ruler in the world superpower Babylon. They were in there and they came out because who they were was not who they were in the mind of the Babylonians. Who they were was who they were in the eyes of a living God. Can you say amen? That's not about denominations. Some people get caught up in their denomination. Unless you remember my church, you're not saved. Oh, the angels must cry. Because when Jesus comes, there's only one group. The group that loves him. And I believe they're in every church. There was one lonely voice responding. (laughs) This moment is a moment that we have not gone through yet. I've had some moments that were close. I was sharing this message in a city. We came to the end of the seminar. We had it planned on our schedule to go home. When my grandson, six years old, was in the hospital, he just had special gifts. Everybody loved him at the school he went to. Dr. Ben Carson had already had five or six operations on little Ben, our grandson. And this was another operation. You see, my grandson had just a little bit of DNA changed, if I may. I'm not a medical professional, as you know. To where when he was born, his fingers were in a skin glove. They were in there. He could move them, but they were in a skin glove. And when you're all born, you have 11, I believe, bones in your skull. And when you go through the birth canal, they, they enclose a little bit. And your head gets a little smaller when it comes through. Then it goes back out to a normal size. His was all fused together. Well, they recognized the challenge that he faced when he was born. So Dr. Carson got involved and he said, look, you're you're gonna have to have operations regularly because the brain grows very quickly in the first five, six, seven years. And you have to make room for that growth in there. He will have excruciating pains. Sure enough, it wasn't long. His brain grew and his head would not grow to fit it. So I had to take him into John Hopkins University and cut him from ear to ear and break up all the skull and reshape it and wire it in place. He had gone through a number of these operations, so this one was scheduled. Peggy and I made sure we were back there for them. I remember setting in his room. He had already gone through the surgery. This time it was extensive. They reshaped his face to match the size of his head. He had a a big wire structure over here that my daughter was going to have to turn the screws and bring those. It was just an unbelievable circumstance. But everybody in Ben's school loved him. He was loved by them all. After being with him three days, it was my time to travel about an hour and a half to a church where I was going to do a baptism for a number of my relatives. It was a high day. That went well, and I was finishing up and back in the room changing. And my wife came through the door and said, Lynn, we've got to go. Benjamin's in trouble. He was in an induced coma, and they had a nurse with him 24-7. Johns Hopkins University there in Baltimore, the best hospital, supposedly. But this was one of those days where my faith was tested. Because the nurse that was on duty there heard a little noise in his one lung. They said, you know, we're going to have to get a sample of that because we're concerned it may be infection. We don't want him to get pneumonia in that lung. So they pulled the breathing tube out went to get a sample, and his air passageway was so small that they couldn't get back in. They did a trach, but when they put the air tube in, by this time there was a number of medical professionals in the room, and this nurse was in training, and she was supposed to do this, and what she did was put the tube clear through the air passageway, and she blew the chest up so the lungs couldn't take in any air. And my daughter 
whose son lay on the bed in a coma, watched her son for 40-some minutes die. We were half the way from the baptism down to Baltimore, and we got that phone call that said Benjamin had passed. At that moment, no tears could take care of the pain. As his sister was in the back seat, we gave her the news. To this day, she remembers that moment where all of our security in asking God to take care of Ben, all of our security in our faith that we thought would carry him through, he had gone through so many times before. There always must be the moment of test. Jesus said, many call me Jesus, but it's just a lip action. These men had to be tested to the place where they were willing to die, lose all their security before they knew the value of their creator and the relationship thereof. So they fell down in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Can you imagine Hananiah saying, Mishael, are you, are, are you there? Yeah, what are we gonna do? I don't know. <laughs> you know, there's no plan for this. And then they could feel the ropes loosening up. And as they began to get their composure, can you imagine them standing up? And what was interesting to me, is they didn't stand up and just, let's get out of here. They were in the highlight of their life. They stood in the midst as an example. If this is what God has created me for, here I stand. I can do no other. Then Nebuchadnezzar, watch, watch, here it comes. <laughs> he gets an Alzheimer moment. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spoke and said to the counselors, watch, here's the counterfeit wise men. Every chapter from one through six, it's Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Ezra versus the counterfeits. Here it comes. He rose in haste, spoke to his counselors. Uh, excuse me, didn't we cast three men in the midst of fiery furnace? Alzheimer moment. He doubted his own thoughts. And he had to ask the other wise men. They answered, said uh, to the king, true, okay, oh, uh, you did, just three. Here it comes. He knew about God, but he didn't know God. He answered, said, lo, I see a fourth man walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the fourth of the form is like what? Who? The Son of God. He knew who Jesus was. Why? Because Daniel loved that king. He communicated with him every time. And when he threw these three men in there, he knew about Daniel's God, but he didn't know the power of God. He identified Jesus. Listen, friends, you know what they say? There's no atheist in the foxhole. There's a lot of people that make fun of you because you stand for Christian principles. But I promise you, friends, when Jesus comes, if they don't choose to follow him between now and then, they'll know God. This moment is a moment for us tonight. Don't ever believe that your faith is going to keep you from being tried. Just look up persecution. It's what gives you patience. Do you really want to be patient? It's quiet in here tonight, isn't it? Patience comes through much tribulation. Oh, but Lynn, I want to be raptured out before the tribulation. We'll talk about that. It's not what we want. It's what God wants. Amen. Your time of trouble is, may not be in the future in a fiery furnace, I pray it isn't. It may be that you're woke up in the middle of the night and you're homeless. You got the notice in the mail, it's no longer yours. It may be when you find that note on the table that your husband or wife says that's enough, I want no more of this. Your moment of trial may not be some moment now that you're going through, but come very soon, the unexpected. It's our worst enemy. God says, I have your faith. I'll continue to give it to you if you'll spend time with me. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. It's free. 
It's sitting on the shelf. It's waiting on you. God loves you, what do you say? God wants you to understand the only security that lasts forever is the security that's in your creator. When you get the news from the doctor like I have three times in my life with the big C word, and you wonder how much longer you have to live, it'll test your faith. It'll bring you to the place where your prayers change, where the begging of your heart is something that's happening now, not something you read about. Your testimony will change. And all of us will do one of two things. Call on God like Peter sinking in the water or curse him and die. Because life without Christ is no life at all. Tonight, my friends, it's not the house you live in that gives you peace. It's the God that's given you life and will continue to sustain your life according to his plan. As I close tonight, I want to share this final story. You know, when, when we were younger and I was going through college, believe it or not, I was younger at one time, God gave us the opportunity of having four years in college. And we, my daughter had many animals. She loves animals. I was a farm boy when I was young. I don't know where she got her love of animals from. But anyway, she had 30-some birds in the laundry room. When we go down to put laundry in the washer and dryer or change them, you know, they were just all hollering at the same time. She had hand-fed every one of those birds as they hatched out of the egg. So believe me, they were all pets. And you had to go down let them all out of the cage, and they all tried to beckon for your attention all over your head, leaving deposits where you didn't want them. But they, they were awesome. They were just full of love. You could spend hours in the laundry room. Well, we learned a very valuable lesson, talking about times of test. You know, the way to teach a bird how to imitate a sound is to put them in a cage and cover them with a cloth that lets no light in. And then you play the sound you want them to repeat. And a smart bird, it doesn't take long, but a bird without very little brain, it'll take them days. You know, you just play it over and over and over until finally it starts imitating it. Are you getting the principle? The sound one makes in the darkness of life is the sound that you'll make the rest of your life. Do we praise God when we lose everything? I spent 12 years volunteering in a prison. And those men in prison would shock me every time they'd say, I praise God because I found God in prison. The song you sing in the darkness will be the song that you sing throughout eternity. Hang on to your faith. It's priceless. It's something you can cherish until you see Jesus face to face. Let me close with a song. Oh, before we do that, let me finish reading the text. I can't leave him without the ice cream on the top. <laughs> then Nebuchadnezzar came near the burning furnace, and he said, spoken to these men, please come out. <laughs> Can't you see it now? The leader of the world had no power in that place. Did you get it? Those who accuse you and put you in the darkest moment of your life, quite honestly, they couldn't go through that test. So don't hate your enemy. When we understand chapter 3, we will feel sorry for our enemy. Because without the faith God gives you, they could not go through the difficulty that you are able to with the power of God. It will help you to love your enemy when we understand this position. Because the men didn't come out and say, all right, king, where are you now? You go in there. Army, throw them in. No! They came out and loved the king as they did before her time. They respected and honored the king. They didn't give him a mouthful. See, our God did it. I told you. No, these were godly people. 
They knew Nebuchadnezzar was God's creation too. The greatest challenge Christians have is to love our enemy. And the Bible says in Revelation, before Jesus comes, we will. We'll sing the song of Moses. Moses' song was, Lord, take my name out of the book of life, but give those people at the foot of the mountain one more chance. We'll sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. The Lamb was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And all the other wise men came together, and they saw that Hanani, Mishael, and Azariah had no fire on them. They didn't even have the smell of smoke. Are you getting the message tonight? Their hair wasn't even smelling like smoke. You know, hair picks up a smell of, air, of your home, everything that you're around. The fire had passed on them but didn't touch them. Let's say it together. Just when I need him, Jesus is near. Just when I falter, just when I fear, Jesus will help me what? Comfort and cheer. Come on. Just when I need him most. It's a gift we haven't received, but God wants to give it to us. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, blessed be the God of these men. And then he goes on to be the king again. You better do what this God tells you or you're going to be cast in. You'll be cut in pieces. He makes a law honoring the God with a death penalty attached. Oh, that's good. No, it wasn't. God never wants us to force other people to worship him. True worship comes from the heart. Amen. King promoted these men in Babylon. Friends, tonight, God's gift is free. What do you say? And he wants us to be so excited about his free gift that we offer it to others. Absolutely free and clear. Has nothing to do with denomination. Has everything to do with our creator, God. And God's people said, Amen. all right, let me close with a song. Pulling you down And all that you can see Are the tears on the ground I know it's hard to understand That he is really there And it's harder to believe that Jesus really cares. But in the middle of it all, he's always close beside you to constantly remind you. That it's from his strength we draw. And when the night just lingers on, he's not that far at all. He'll never let you fall. He'll hear you when you call. He's in the middle of it all. Find peace you can't explain and hope to see you through at the mention of his name he'll be there to comfort you when everything goes wrong his praise will be your song and joy from deep within will we fill
reveal your heart again and in the middle of it all he's always close beside you to constantly remind you that it's from his strength you draw when the night just lingers on he's not that far at all he'll never let you fall he'll hear you when you call he's in the middle of it all night just lingers on he's not that far at all he'll never let you fall he'll hear you when you call he's in the middle of it all he'll never let you When you call, he's in the middle of it all. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. How many believe that tonight? That's right. Simple faith, but cherish it. It'll carry you through. Heavenly Father, tonight these stories, yes, they're simple stories. But we have not absorbed all of the story as you want us to yet. We've caught a glimpse of what our faith will be like before we see you face to face. And Father, we know we can't create it in us, for we mess up everything we get our hands in. You give us permission to make choices. And Father, we want to gain such faith from you that someday soon we will truly honor you by our very thoughts and feelings not only of you but of our worst enemy and our prayers will reflect our love for you and our love for our enemy so father tonight we thank you for this gift of faith in the name of jesus god's people said God bless you all. Look forward to you coming back tomorrow night. And I hope tomorrow night you know what chapter wasn't written by Daniel. <laughs>